Montpelier was a good town to be brought up in. You know everybody in town. Montpelier was an interesting place uh, because I think people were quite friendly. Well, a lot of continuity of families. People, I guess. There was, it was a place where you knew everybody. Uh, you go downtown and uh, you knew everybody, either by name or reputation. I liked the stores, I liked the, the way they took care of you, you know. Montpelier has always been one of the country's smallest capital cities. As the government center of Vermont in the early 1900s, it was a town where everyone knew everybody and everything. Aside from being the home to Vermont politics, Montpelier had several well-established businesses, including banking and insurance companies. Along the Winooski River, other industries like tanneries and granite works were established to refine stone from the famous quarries in nearby Barrie. The history of this dynamic little city has been well documented over the years, but for many people it's the simple pleasures of growing up that made their memories of Montpelier so special. Back in those days you didn't have recreation departments, so you lived more on uh, imagination and you're on your own. Young people were all downtown. You would go with friends to prowl the streets because nobody had cars and people just roamed the streets and there weren't really any places to go except to walk around and meet boys. Well when we were kids everybody stopped across his bakery and bought the candy for a penny. Barquins. That's where we lived after school. <laughs> we all went down. We would come in and have Coca-Colas. We played out in the street in a bunch of kids together. We played kick the can. Well, we had an old can and we used to have sides and kick. I remember that. We didn't go two by two. We were always in crowds, we kids growing up. And we made our own entertainment, you might say. Be some, what we used to call the big trees up on the corner of Felt Street and Berlin Street. And you know, we'd go up and sit in the trees and talk. Things like that, you know. Well, you didn't have a lot of things because you didn't have the money to buy things and there weren't as many things to buy. But, uh, you know, you read library books and um, went to the movies because there wasn't any black box in your, your house to watch. And uh, you played outside because, well, you did play games inside. I mean, that's, you know, board games, that sort of thing. But um, it seemed like we spent a lot more time out, you know, skiing and skating in the winter and uh, ball games and, and uh, you know, kick the can and all that sort of thing out in the neighborhoods in the evening. There was always something to do and plenty of people to see downtown. But with a lack of transportation, kids often stayed close to home and had to depend on their own creativity to help pass the time. Uh, most of our activities in the neighborhood were confined to a relatively small little nucleus of, uh, of, of, of neighborhood children. We had neighborhoods where kids would gather, you know, and play. And, uh, They'd be this end of College Street, these kids, and the other end of College Street, and the other sections of town, but we'd, we'd get together and do things. Our little, this end of College Street, we used to have a circus in, I guess it was July every summer. We had a little circus, and we'd have a parade, and, and there was a, um, a circus that the kids put on. It would be pretty, pretty corny. <laughs> Neighborhood gangs were common as well as plenty of friendly competition. Bragging rights were at stake at every summer afternoon baseball game. For example, we uh, used to have a baseball team here called the Barry Street Clippers. And the Meadow always had their baseball team. And there used to be great rivalry between those two. Uh, the Bailey Avenue Braves. And we would schedule games with them. I was very informal. We'd play on the 
seminary campus. Harry Seabright, Ed Roby, oh gee, and the Lions, that was a big family. We play ball right where the school, where the present school is now. That was a big campus, a baseball field. And we used to play baseball on that field. And it was understood we home plate was always near the school. We're always hitting foul balls and going through a window. And so we just automatically, we had to go into the principal and say, we broke a window. Yeah, I know. And it would cost you 75 cents or something like that. And so everybody had a chip and a nickel or a dime, pay for the window, and then we go back playing baseball. <laughs> Kids would come from around and we'd pick up games and play. We were playing there one Sunday afternoon, and a man came by and he said, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Turned out the field was owned by Bob Peter Seminary, and they did not allow entertainment activities on Sundays. So uh, we left, but they didn't mind other days. We played, believe it or not, up on Sabin's pasture. They let us uh, use that for a ball field. If you hit a ball on the lower flat, you know, it rolled down almost to Barry Street. You know, you only had one ball, so you had to go get it. There were always a few events that would gather people together each year, like town meeting or the 4th of July celebration. But for kids, nothing was as popular as when the circus came to town. Well, when the circus came to town and we were kids, they'd have a big parade you know, down Main Street, State Street, with the elephants and all that. Oh, that was a big day when the circus came to town. And they'd come in by rail. That was another thing, come by train. So we'd go down early in the morning and watch them unload. That was really more fun than maybe the circus. See the elephants working and the horses. It's a beautiful horses. And we kids would go down there and work and get a ticket to go to the circus. Whether you were attending the circus, playing baseball, or kick the can, every kid knew when it was time to head home. In the evening, we'd always play kick the can, and the mothers all had whistles that they'd blow, and it was time for us to come in at night. Oh, you'd know your own whistle, yeah. <laughs> yeah. About 8 or 8.30, the parents would start yelling at us, come home, come home. Oh yes, we had a curfew. The uh, fire alarm ran uh, at uh, two blasts on the horn at uh, 10 minutes to nine, and that meant the young people were supposed to scurry off the streets and go home. When that curfew rang there on top of City Hall, you knew it was time to go home. The winters of yesteryear always seemed colder and a heck of a lot snowier than today. Heavy snow accumulations and freezing temperatures were cursed by adults. But for kids, snow and ice opened the door to a slew of activities that made Vermont winters so memorable. In the wintertime, we skated all the time. And we would skate on the river, which could have been a little hazardous at times. But uh, put your skates on at home and, and go down the hill sidestepping and then jump off into the... Uh, and somebody always kept it shoveled off, so you didn't have to do that. We used to slide quite a bit. Uh, in those days, uh, you know, I can recall sliding down Fulton Avenue and Hubbard Street and other streets in the city were posted by the city for sliding. And... In that era, there were not many cars to begin with, and a lot of people uh, put their cars up in the wintertime on blocks so they'd preserve the tires. Didn't plow the streets much. And so they would post the uh, streets for many of the streets for sliding purposes. And then the uh, city would send a truck around and spread sand at the end of the street so you wouldn't slide out into, into the road. A farmer would come down to town with a, a big team of horses to get feed. And when they'd go up the hill, 
we did sometimes they'd let us kids hook our uh, sleds onto the back and pull us up the hill so we could slide down. You've seen pictures of snow rollers, mammoth big wooden thing of man to sit up on the top to to run the probably four horse at least in order to roll the snow down so it wouldn't be too deep for the horses to wade through. When these were short of snow, Corner State and Maine would begin to get bare and these uh, Teamsters uh, would have a lot of trouble hauling their uh, sleds across that bare surface and the farmers would bring their shovels with them. When they get to Corner State and Maine, they'd shovel snow over the bare spots in order to get their teams to be able to pull the sleds over them. Getting around in the winter was difficult by our standards, and even more of a challenge during mud season. But in the summertime, the streets of downtown Montpelier were often filled with horse and buggy traffic. Nobody had a car in those days. They couldn't afford them. People that lived in Berlin, up around Berlin Corners up there, and some of them worked at the old E.W. Bailey Mill, where the Shaw's is now. And they would come to work with a horse and buggy. They used to keep them down at Mr. Perkins' livery stable down in back of uh, City Hall, the Blanchard Block. Horses came in from the country, and they had a uh, long railing down behind the fire station uh, where the farmers would come and hitch their horses, deliver their uh, butter and eggs, and then go back home again. So the horses just stayed there while they, while they, when they made their deliveries. If they came down in a, in a buggy or a wagon, they would always carry a, a weight with a chain on it, and they'd put that in the, in the horse's mouth, and that would hold them. But there was also a lot of, of uh, places to tie the horses up. For most frugal Vermonters, purchasing an automobile just didn't make sense. In Montpelier, if you couldn't travel by horse, there was always the trolley. The trolley system was a critical means of transportation that helped bridge the gap between the days of horse and buggy and the era of the automobile. I think people generally don't have any sense of how much transportation there was by trolley car. Nobody had cars and they rode the uh, trolleys. It took you all the way up to Barrie from Montpelier. The trolley system started at the corner of State Street and Bailey Avenue. And it ran up State Street, turned on to Main, turned on to Barry Street, and as I say, it was right in the middle of the road here. I had a heck of a good time because we used to raise the devil with the trolleys. On top of the trolley, there's an arm that went up like this to the wire above the track, which provided the electricity that moved the car. However, there was a circle like this that went over the wire and that's through which came the electricity to the trolley car. Well if you were a kid and you wanted to have a little fun you got behind the trolley car and reached up like this and pulled that thing down and then turned around and ran as fast as you could go. Well when you let it go it went up like this and right by the place it was supposed to meet so it stopped the car dead in its tracks. We used to hear from that. The trolley people didn't like that very much. And what we kids used to do, which was a naughty thing to do, we'd put little stones on the tracks and like to see the trolley come and squash them out, you know. Well, one day, I guess one of our stones was a little bit too big. And I wish I could remember the name of the captain. He was the nicest, jolliest man. <laughs> he stopped the trolley. And he came over and told us we were not to do that again. That <laughs> it was dangerous. And well, we never did that again. But I can remember we kids sitting there. Many Montpelier residents outside the downtown area were self-sufficient. 
the era of family farms was still alive and well. Raising a dairy cow and a handful of chickens to help provide for the family was a common way of life. Where we lived, we always had chickens. We had a pig and we had a big garden. You didn't have the big farms. You had what they call family farms. When we moved to Liberty Street, uh, it was the Bryans. They had uh, two or four cows or whatever it was. And they used to, uh, they didn't have any pasture there, so they walked them all the way up North Street, pasture. And the Bryan boys would herd them down Liberty and up uh, uh, Loomis and across Jay and up North Street. And your cow flaps were all the way uh, and up the street. Most families had a milk cow, and, and uh, they might have, oh, say, five or six cows and sell the milk to Big Marvin, and then they'd go to work. Marvin had a, a plant there on Berlin Street where farmers would bring milk, and then he'd sell it, you know, house to house, bottle it, and made a good living that way. See, we knew the folks on a familiar basis actually put the delivered milk right in the refrigerator for them. It was a small operation and sort of a very neighborhood friendly atmosphere, so to speak. Home deliveries of items like milk, fresh baked bread, and ice blocks for the refrigerator were common. Every house had cards about that, oh, mid six or eight inches by five inches or so, different colors. You know, the bread, I think, was a yellow card. You'd put up the yellow card in the window and the bakery man would spot the yellow card and know you wanted to stop and wanted to buy. So they didn't necessarily go to every house. They went to the house that had the card up. Everybody had a refrigerator, but they're not electrical. So they go house to house and uh, fill that refrigerator the top with ice. They would cut the ice in the winter time and store it. They have layers of sawdust to keep them uh, into the summer. Ice would be delivered in your section of Montpelier say on Tuesday. Well you put this card in your window. But they would have these big cakes of ice on the wagon and the fellow would take his ice pick and cut them down uh, into smaller pieces. So he would know how big your refrigerator was and he might cut a 10 pound or 20 pound and they had charged so much a pound for ice. And all the kids would trail him along trying to get a piece of ice, you know. Just... In the early 20th century, Montpelier was already established as a government market service and industrial center in the region. Several banks and insurance companies took root in the heart of the capital city. By 1925, nine granite works were established in the city to refine stone from the famous quarries in Barry. Stonework, along with tanneries and other manufacturing industries, attracted talented immigrants from several European countries. The French people, most of them worked in the stone shed. They lived on the lower end of Barry Street. Italians and the Spanish were on Sibley Avenue, um, Foster Street, part of Barry Street, and across the river. I grew up on River Street in Montpelier, and the neighborhood was quite a mixed neighborhood. It was a mixture of blue and white collar. Uh, however, it invariably was on the south side of the tracks and the Winooski River and quite detached from the main part of Montpelier, so to speak. We used to uh, call ourselves uh, the uh, other part of town across the river. We were the more the, let's say, the poor areas, what you might call the laborers. Uh, the granite community, of course, everybody in my family was employed in some way or connected in some way to the granite community and all of the people uh, or many of the people in our neighborhood either owned a plant 
or, or managed a plant or, or somehow uh, had an occupation in that plant. Uh, so it was very much ingrained in our life. My father was a monumental draftsman for the Excelsior Granite Works. And I remember going into the granite plant as a small boy. And of course, in his office, there would be the distinct smell of sharpened pencils and uh, the, many, the many of the drawings he worked on. The variety of business established in Montpelier led to a very diverse yet close-knit community. This diversity of skills and ethnic backgrounds also helped in making the city a regional center for arts and entertainment. Montpelier was a city filled with hard-working people trying to achieve their American dream. My Italian grandfolks came into, this, into the state in 1888. Uh, they had their home in Montpelier. Many times the station manager from the uh, railroad would send a horse and buggy up to the Pioneer neighborhood to get one or the other of my grandfolks to bring them down to the station and have them act as an interpreter for these uh, rather bewildered new arrivals in the state. And many times uh, these people would be taken home by my grandfolks and actually furnished room and board until they were able to get established in the community either in Barrie or Montpelier. And I, I as a child can say that uh, from the early morning time up until noon, up until 12 o'clock, there would be a hum that would start in the neighborhood. And it was a very distinct hum, like nothing else. And it would be of all the machinery working in those plants. And it would wind right down at 12 o'clock, noon. And at 1 o'clock, you could set your clock by it. It would just start right up again and run till 4. But it was always that background din of, of noise that came from all that equipment running. We were a very close-knit group. The kids all got along fine. Everybody worked hard. And we played together. And I, I was proud to be an Italian. But yet, when we'd go to school, I always felt sometimes that they thought we were from the wrong side of the track, which, which that's how I felt at first. To begin with, my parents felt the United States was the most marvelous place they had ever been to. Uh, the attitude of people and uh, more importantly uh, the fact that my dad could have a good job at the granite shed but uh, my mother felt that once they were in the United States they were Americans and she not only wanted to learn the language but both my father and mother became American citizens and voted. As my grandfather, my Italian grandfather came here in 1888, he passed away in 1911. He had 23 years of, 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 of life in the industry in this country and what just comes to my mind is the significance of the health hazard that these people faced. I mean his life was so short-lived and I would very much have to say that his early death at age 47 had a dramatic impact on my grandmother and her family, uh, not only to bear up against the loss of, the, of, of my grandfather, but also to bear up economically and financially. They call this, the Barry Street, the street of widows, because so many of their husbands uh, succumbed to uh, silicosis. Many of them, their husbands died when uh, their families were very young. They made wine, and grandpa to sell. They had to do that in order to live. They didn't have enough money to support their families. So they did have some, pro, you know, during prohibition time. And you could arrange a dinner with one of the ladies up there. Tremendous feed. That was a very, very uh, central uh, social location up there for all the people in Montpelier to go. They'd go there on Sunday mornings and they'd go for dinner and uh, they would go at night to buy liquor and wine and so forth. It was a thriving business. Curtis said that uh, they were 
particularly the women, just couldn't understand how it could be illegal during Prohibition. How, how can selling wine be illegal? But many people, you know, got raided. The City Hall Tower, or where the, the City Hall clock is now, they would put a, a red light in that tower, and that meant they had to bring the cops in, all two or three of them, <laughs> to go on the, these raids. Any Friday night, when I was a little kid in high school, I understood this. You could go up to Charlie Colombo's mother's house and during Prohibition, and you get all the booze you wanted. Police never bothered her. If they'd gone up there to her house on a Friday, they'd have gotten a hold of the mayor and everybody else in town that help run the city. My friend and I were remembering all the different ones that got raided. I don't know who it was at the house that, oh yes, we understood that woman went to college. She was a very smart person. And my friend said, she didn't go to college. She ended up going to jail because of the liquor she'd been selling. What this small capital city may have lacked in size, it certainly made up for in character. Over the past century, a lot has changed in Montpelier. Most of the farms have faded from the hillsides, and many of the industries that once dotted the banks of the Winooski River have vanished. But the one thing that will never fade for the people who spent their lives in this amazing little city are the wonderful memories of Montpelier.